few weeks and unable just rearing to get into the pulpit and just share what God has been uh, working in his heart and life with. I have gotten the impression that Satan probably does not want this message presented this morning. Um, by the way, I need to break myself of saying, um, <laughs> I, I listened to my message last week. Um, I did it again. <laughs> Let's put it this way. <clears throat> I don't drink. I never have. <laughs> but if there was a drinking game for every time the word um was said, I never would have made it past the first point. It was pretty bad. I'm going to do my best to break myself of that. Over the years, I used to speak in different churches uh, to fill in for different pastors, and I got pretty good at not doing that, but I've been <laughs> out of the pulpit for a while, and old habits tend to creep back. We will do our best. So maybe what I should do is put some skin in the game, and every time I say, um, I have to give Lois a dollar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That idea she likes. <laughs> I would encourage you, if you take notes, make sure you write down some of the additional verses that I'll be giving today. If you don't take notes, I would encourage you to begin doing that. The message today is extremely critical in our understanding of love and marriage and what God intends, not only for a husband and wife, but even for single individuals. Uh, it's, um, I just did it. There's one. <laughs> also, on the inside of the bulletin, there's uh, what, they, what we refer to, I guess, as a blurb. Make sure you read that. It's got a very important point that we're going to drive home today. Hang on to that and spend some time thinking about it and praying about it. This world is doing everything it can to destroy God's concept of love and marriage and purity. And Satan is such a master at what he does he actually began trying to break up the marriage all the way back in the Garden of Eden when he singled out Eve and got her over by the tree. He was doing his best to break up that marriage. You know, it was only a day old, but he did his best to see what he could do to break it up. Let me turn on my uh, lightsaber here. Today, the second Sunday of February is always World Marriage Day. Today we're going to learn a little bit about what marriage really is in God's eyes. To begin that, we must ask our question, first of all, is there a God? Because if there is no God, then it really doesn't matter what the Bible says, you know, the the stories that are in the Bible are nothing more than stories or fables. But if there is indeed a God, and he has a plan and a purpose for everything, then we need to find out what God wants, what God says, what God designed us to be. Evolution is one of those things that I think Christians are kind of blindsided by it. It's not so much just the concept that, you know, we came from a chunk of slime and everything in the world all evolved from that chunk of slime, whether it's a bird or a snail or a fish or a human being. If you can buy into that teaching or that philosophy, it's much easier then to, to figure that it really doesn't matter about purity and it really doesn't matter about our relationships, we can pretty much do what we want to do because there are no rules. If there's no God, there's no rules, and, and we can pretty much do whatever we want. But again, if there is a God, then we need to find out what his plan and what his purpose is for, for love and marriage especially.
begin by looking at specifically what the Word of God says about uh, adultery and lust. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 14, this is the first giving of the law. Um, that I just did it again. That's two bucks. <laughs> Exodus 20, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. Seems like a rather simple phrase, but there's a lot packed into that. First of all, the word adultery. What does adultery really signify? First of all, marriage. How many times have you looked at that and thou shalt not commit adultery and not realize that God was speaking about marriage not only as an institution, but marriage as a standard. Some of the other laws that we looked at, thou shalt not lie, what's the standard? Truth. Thou shalt not steal, what's the standard? Working and giving. Everything that God has in those commandments is a standard on a positive side, and adultery has to do with the positive thing that God instituted, and that is marriage itself. Matthew 27, Matthew 5, 27 and 28. Christ is speaking here, and he's clarifying something about that verse that we just read. Verse 27 says, You have heard that it was said, and of course they heard it because it's in the law, you shall not commit adultery. Then Christ goes on to say this, But I say unto you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Christ gives us a little bit deeper understanding now of what adultery really entails. And remember I said that adultery presupposes that marriage is the standard. Well, what about somebody that is not married, a single person? Can they commit adultery? Yeah, if, if they you know, have relations with a married person. But even beyond that, we need to realize that there are wider principles in Scripture than just what we see on the face. Literally, adultery has to do with anything that falls outside of the institution of marriage. Anything. So whether you're single, uh, whether you're married, Whatever the situation is, anything that falls outside of the boundaries of marriage is considered adultery. Well, how can that be? If, if you're single and not married, how can you commit adultery? We'll get into that as we view some of these scriptures. But just to give it to you in a nutshell, to start out with, when you do get married, if you've already been with another person, you've committed adultery with the person you just married or you've committed adultery on the person that you just married. You're no longer pure. Now you're impure when you marry them because of what you've done prior to that. Does that make sense at all? Is that kind of kind of a cloudy way to say it? Well, when we look at some of the other scriptures, I hope that'll make it a little bit more uh, understandable. The book of Job, chapter 31, verse 1. Now, Job is a contemporary with Abraham. So you need to understand that the law of Moses has not been given at this point. This is about 450 years before the law is given. Job chapter 31, verse 1, I believe. Yes, Job 31, verse 1. Job says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze upon a virgin? So Job understood that to look at a woman, I, he, he's basically saying the same type of thing that Christ was saying in the New Testament, to look at a woman and have impure thoughts about it is wrong. It's just as wrong as committing adultery. Now it's interesting that he mentions a virgin in particular rather than saying a woman in general. Because it was understood even prior to the law that adultery was wrong. Even the heathen kings understood that adultery was wrong. As a matter of fact, uh, Abraham had 
lied about Sarah being his wife, and a king took his wife into his harem, I guess you could say. God did protect her so that he never laid a hand on her whatsoever, but God instantly began punishing that king and his kingdom. Not a woman in that kingdom was able to, to have a child during that time period. And once he found out that Abraham's wife was actually his wife and not his sister, as he had said, this pagan king says something pretty amazing. He says, don't you realize that I could have slept with your wife and been severely judged by God? But because I did this out of ignorance, out of my own pure heart, you know, I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't slept with her. But he knew that God would judge him because that was an adulterous relationship. This is 450 years before the law. There are many things that we can trace in Scripture that, that take place before the law is ever given. So we know that these are, um, these are principles that God has instituted from the very beginning of creation and will run through till the end of time. But a virgin, he specifies that because maybe it wasn't completely understood at that time that a, a virgin was equally as bad to look at, but he understood it. He understood that he shouldn't commit adultery, and he understood that looking at somebody in a lustful way, a virgin, was equally as bad as committing adultery. I want to move on to the next point. Point number two is one flesh. Turn with me back to the very beginning. Uh, the beginning is where, well, I, I like I like to boil everything down to a beginning point, and it's pretty good that God put the beginning in the beginning, because it's easier to follow that way. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse 20. The man gave names to all livestock, and to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed it up with the flesh. And the rib that God, that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to him. And Adam said, This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold to his wife. They shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So there's a lot packed into this, but you need to understand something very, very specifically. Very specific. Adam himself was created in the image of God. Eve was not created at the same time Adam was. When God created the birds, he created a male and a female of each bird. When he created fish, he created a male and a female of each fish. When he created cattle, male and a female of each cattle. But when he created man, he created man in his own image, and he only created the man. And I think he did it for a reason. Because when he gave man the woman... The woman was literally taken out of the man. So we can illustrate it this way. God made Adam in his own image. And I've got the chromosomes there, the XY chromosome. And he took out of Adam this rib and formed a woman who was called Eve. And all women have the XX chromosome. Men, all men, have the XY chromosome. I do a little bit of family genealogy, and I did have my DNA tested to find out if I could trace some ancestors back. And it did help because some of the ancestors that I was not quite sure about, the DNA proved that, yes, they were indeed my ancestors. 
when I took the test, they made it very clear that the man's DNA will trace both the man's family line back all the way, you know, each one of the men down through the family line, but it also traces the, the mother's side back on the, on the mother's line. Unfortunately, a woman's DNA won't give the whole story. Because the woman has the XX DNA, she can trace the, the woman's side. Now it does, obviously, for every woman that's married, you know, you will find that connection, but it traces the woman's side. It's also interesting that through all of the DNA research that they've done, they have discovered that all living human beings come from a single woman. I think the Bible said that a long time before they ever understood DNA. <laughs> yes, all living beings came from a single woman. As a matter of fact, God created man in his image, and he made him male and female, according to Genesis 1.27. Remember, though, he didn't make male and female instantaneous like he did every other creature, he did it in a very specific and a very different way. Because rather than having a male and a female um, cow and bull, he made the man and took out of man the woman. And the two of them were indeed one flesh. And the man and woman had children. And it takes a man and a woman to have a child. If we look at the DNA tree, you can trace your DNA back. Uh, again, there's the father's side and there's the mother's side. The DNA that I had tested, I mean, it gave beautiful lines going all the way back. Um, let's go to the next slide. But you can reverse the procedure and go all the way back to Adam and Eve and realize that all living people came from Adam and Eve. Nature is kind of a funny thing. When God created everything, everything reproduced after its own kind. With human beings, it takes a male and a female to reproduce. Now there are some species that um, are used as an example that I think snails and earthworms can actually change their sex and reproduce by changing their sex. That's the way God made them. And that's the way they reproduce. Human beings can only reproduce one way. Animals that are male and female can only produce one way. But creatures that God created to be either or or changeable, that's the way God created them but they always reproduce after their kind. You don't find a snail changing its sex and producing a fish because that's not its kind. If a snail changes its sex, it is to reproduce and have more snails. That, that's just the way it is. So Genesis chapter 3 verse 20 tells us again that uh, Eve was the mother of all living. Turn with me, if you will, to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 6 through 9. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. But remember, he did this completely differently than he did for every other created creature. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold to his wife. Now there is a principle in scripture that when God repeats himself that he is making a very, very important point. And in this particular passage, God is repeating himself. You might not realize it, but he is. He mentions the man leaving his father, so you've got two generations there, and mother, which is necessary to have a child and holding fast to his wife, which obviously is a woman. So God has repeated himself there at least for two generations. 
a man and his wife, a father and a mother, and that father and mother is on both sides. The, the wife has a father and mother just like the man has a father and mother. But notice what it says in verse 8, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And this goes back to the fact that when God created Adam in his image and he took part of Adam out and made Eve, she was literally one flesh with him. She was flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. She was one with Adam. And God says that's the way we should look at marriage. When a husband and wife become husband and wife, God says they're no longer two, they're one. And then he says, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And we often think of that in terms of marriage itself, but I think it goes even further than that. I think it's the whole concept of marriage. God says, don't, don't change my plan. Don't change what I've created. Don't change the fact that this is the way I want things to be. And what is our society doing today? It's trying to change the whole concept of what marriage is. Marriage can basically be between anybody or anything. I heard of an uh, instance recently where a man actually married his cell phone. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to point number three. Christ in his body, because this is where it really starts getting deep. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 25. And I'm going to kind of go through this verse by verse as, as we hit this passage. So the husband is to love the wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And I have to tell you, this one verse is what really changed my relationship with my wife many years ago. You know, she put up with a lot when we were first married. But once I saw this, that I should love my wife the way Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, every time something would come up in our marriage or any type of disappointment or whatever it may have been, I would think as to my relationship with Christ. How many times have I done something to disappoint Christ? And yet he loves me. How many times have I fallen short of what Christ thought I should be? And yet he died for me. This is the same attitude that a husband needs to have for his wife. And that word loved is that word agape which is full-blown, love you so much that I'm willing to die for you type love. And that's what Christ did. That's the kind of love that a husband should have for his wife. A husband should be willing to lay down his life for his wife, just as Christ laid down his life for the church. But there's more to it than just that. As we look at verse 26, oh, and I do need to make this point again. God never asks us to do something that he has not done first. And in this marriage relationship, Christ did it, and he is being used as the example. Christ did it, and he wants us to follow his example. So I think that's a very powerful point. So let's move on to verse 26. So Christ not only loved the church and gave himself for the church, but he did it for a number of reasons. That he might sanctify her, and cleanse her by the washing of water with the word. So husbands, you need to be the spiritual leader of your house and sanctify and cleanse your wife through Bible studies, through prayers, through um, the life that you live, through the example that you give. You need to be that example, just like Christ was, and for the purpose that Christ had to, to make us better, the husband should be there to support his wife and help her to grow. And obviously the husband can't do it if his life is a mess. So it puts a lot of responsibility on us to, to put our lives in line with what the scripture says. 
verse 27, so that he might present her to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. So again, Christ wants the best for us as the body, as believers. So his goal is to help us, give us everything we need so that we can grow and be that holy and spotless church and person that he wants us to be. Verse 28, in the same ways husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. I've read over this verse so many times and had conversations with people so many times and, and the thought that, yeah, we have to love ourselves and in that same way we love our wife, it is not what this verse is saying. It is not what this verse is saying. You remember when, when Adam was divided and Eve was his flesh and his body, his bones, she was in all respects one with him. That's what Christ is saying in, in this passage right here. In the same ways, husbands should love their wives not like they love themselves, but should love their wives because they are themselves. That is a powerful thought. Your wife is you. Your husband is you. You are so much in God's eyes, one, that when we love our spouse as our own body, it's not saying the way we love ourselves. That's not what it's saying. It's saying you love them because they are you. Do you understand that? Your spouse is you. Verse 29. For no one ever yet hated his own flesh. And that's what your wife is. That's what your husband is, your own flesh. But nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. Are we Christ's flesh and bones and body? That's what it says in the next verse, because we are members of his body. Verse 31, therefore, and the, again, God is repeating himself. This passage is repeated so many times throughout scriptures that you have to get this as being God intended it to be this way. This is what God intended. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So we're one body with Christ, and we are one flesh with our spouse. Verse 32. This mystery is profound. I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. I think this is probably the reason that the, the marriage is under such attack today. Because from the very beginning, God intended this to be a picture of of what Christ and the church would be. Now, whether or not Satan understood that in, in Genesis chapter 2 there, I don't know. But he was doing his best to wreck that marriage. And Satan, since that day, has done everything he can to wreck the marriage. In our society today, marriage, nobody even begins to understand marriage anymore nowadays. If, if you can marry your cell phone, you can marry anything. How messed up is that? We totally lose the point of what God is saying, that the husband and wife are one flesh. But you know what? It's the husband and it's the wife. Going back to our example in the very beginning, man was created in God's image. And from man, God created woman. No other creature was ever done that way. It was only the human being. So God was making a point. We are different. We're different than the snails. We're different than the birds. We're different than the bees. We're different than everything. God created us uniquely because we are his image. 
And the fact that he took the woman out of the man was to emphasize this point that you are one. You're not two individuals. You know, unfortunately, how many times have you heard people say, yeah, when I get married, it's, the marriage is going to be 50-50. I'm going to give my 50%. She's going to give 50%. That makes 100%. Wrong. That marriage is going to fail, I'll tell you right now. Because when you get married, you give 100% of yourself to your spouse. And your spouse gives 100% to you. It's not a 50-50 proposition. This is a 100%, 100% proposition. And how do I know that's true? Because that's what Christ did. Did Christ come down here and say, well, I'm going to, you know, maybe I'll die for half the people. Christ came down here. He gave it all. He gave 100%. You can't give more than Christ gave. And again, Christ is our example. So just as Adam and Eve are one flesh, Christ and the church are one flesh. The point is made. We are one as husband and wife just as much as we are one with Christ. It's a powerful example, and the world is trying its best to mess that example up and say that anything goes. Well, if, if evolution is true, then why not anything goes? Because we can make up our own rules at that point, but you know what? God created us. God created us in a very specific way and for a very specific purpose. And it's not for us to make up the rules. God has pretty much set it up the way that he would like it to be. Let's move over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 through 20. Verse 15 says this, Do you not know that your bodies are the members of Christ? Now what does that mean, members of Christ? Is my hand a member of my body? What about my foot? Is that a member of my body? My elbow? Is that a member of my body? You are a member of Christ's body. And every one of you, God has created for a specific purpose to work in this body in a miraculous way, to make this church work, to make uh, the, the Christian believer's body work. Uh, we are all created, but we are literally members of Christ. And in that same way, a spouse is a member with its spouse. He goes on to say in verse 15, Shall we then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Verse, let me see, I might have gone a little bit too fast there. 15, yes, we need to go to verse 16 next. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her for it is written the two will become one flesh but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him so again it's this whole point of being one with Christ and when we give ourselves to somebody who is not our spouse we are one with that other person and as Christ emphasized even doing it in our hearts and in our minds is making that happen. That was never God's intent. God's intent was that the man and the woman would be one and love each other with their whole hearts and give themselves wholly to each other. Let's go to verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. And I want to stop there for just a moment because this is a very important point. Scripture tells us there are a lot of different ways to fight sin. We can stand firm to fight sin. We can put on the armor of God and battle the sin. You know, go fist to fist with, with whatever it is. But this particular sin 
is serious enough that God says, don't stand there and fight. Run. Run. Flee. Flee sexual immorality because you, you can't fight it. If you're going to stay around and think you can beat this thing, you can't. Whether it's something in our life, whether it's something in our heart, whether it's something in our mind, flee. Run from it. Don't try to fight it. Run from it. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin that a person commits is outside the body. But sexual immoral person sins against his own body. And I need to emphasize this again. Yes, if you're single, you're sinning against your own body. But the day you get married, what you have done in your past is carried over into your marriage. You sin against your spouse. Does that make sense? So in this case, a past sin is going to affect the person you marry. Your person is the, the person you marry is not going to be. Um, well, they, they need to understand that that they're marrying somebody who is no longer a virgin. The best gift you can give to your spouse the day you get married is to give yourself as a virgin to that spouse. And by not being a virgin, you are literally taking away that, that joy and privilege and the blessedness of that gift that you can give your spouse. Verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God, you are not your own. So yes, our body is the temple of God, and you know what? Just like the husband belongs to the wife and the wife belongs to the husband, we see the same thing with our relationship with God. Once you're a Christian, you no longer belong to yourself, you belong to God. We don't live that way, do we? You know, we, we love ourselves so much, it's pretty hard to give up control of our lives to God. But that's what God wants. Verse 20. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. And I'm going to give you three references that have made me rethink a lot of things in terms of um, purity Leviticus 18, verse 8, and just write down these references. You don't need to turn there. It says, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife, which would be your stepmother, for this is your father's nakedness. Hmm. Interesting. Leviticus 18, verse 16 says, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. Hmm. Leviticus 20.20 20 says, If a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. These verses are telling us that the wife is 100% the husband's and her nakedness is his nakedness. So if you're not married, how does that really apply? Because someday when you do get married that nakedness is going to belong to your spouse. And if you've given your nakedness to somebody else, um, you, you are robbing your spouse of the, of the purity that you can give them in marriage. First Corinthians chapter 7. And we're going to begin with verse 1. First Corinthians 7, beginning with verse 1. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. This is kind of a poor translation. The ESV generally does very good at translating things. In every single manuscript, every single Greek manuscript, the word that's used there in place of sexual relations is touch. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Because, and I, you know, sexual relations is a portion of that, obviously, but it can be much more. There is inappropriate touch. There is touch that you should not do until you're married. And 
I think all of that is built into this. So it, it's not just the sexual relations. It is literally touching inappropriately. And God says, don't do it. Verse 2. But because of temptation and sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. And again, this goes back to the whole one flesh thing. You know, when you're one flesh with your spouse, that is who God has intended you to be with and to give yourself to and to receive from is that spouse, nobody else. Verse 3, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. And again, this, <laughs> this is a little bit of a poor translation. I know what the translators were trying to do. You know, they're, they're emphasizing... You know, this, this whole passage here is about sexual immorality. But in this case, that conjugal rights should have been translated more closely the affections that are due her. And affections can be much more than, um, than conjugal rights. I, I, I hate that term because it almost sounds like, you know, this is what you must do because it's not like that. Love and affection is something that we give because we love our spouse and we want to please them. We want to do things that, that um, are for their benefit and to show them how much we love and appreciate them. This is not something where it's like, it's written in stone, you got to do this. That's not the way it is. That's not the way God intended it. But the affections that we need to give our spouse is the way God intended it to be. And that infection, that <laughs> that affection <laughs> can take many different forms. And then he goes on to say in verse 4, for the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And isn't that kind of what we saw in those verses in Leviticus, that the wife's nakedness is actually the husband's nakedness and vice versa? So we don't own our own body. When, when we get married, we give up possession of our body to our spouse and says likewise the husband does not have authority over his body but the wife does and and I honestly think us white us men probably have a much better bargain than than the ladies do let's go to Hebrews chapter 13 because this is a really really important thing but again as we look at this verse I'm afraid that it is not been translated as good as it could have been. You know, I, I'm a stickler for going back to the original Greek and seeing what is there and what is really meant and, and what was being said. And translators are doing the best they can to make sure that you understand what the passage is saying. But sometimes they add a word here and there that might change it just a little bit. So let's read it in the ESV. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. Again, that's a bad translation. Because this is presented in the emphatic. The first word in that verse in the Greek, in every single Greek text, is the word honorable. Honorable is marriage in everything. The bed undefiled. So when the translators threw in that little word let, it's like they're saying, okay, so you need to you need to um, you need to look at marriage as being honorable and you need to look at the bed as being undefiled. That's not what it's saying. This is saying what God intends it to be. God calls the marriage bed undefiled. God calls marriage honorable. Now the word honorable is a rather interesting word. Write down this reference because this is kind of a fun reference to go to. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 says, Knowing that you were ransomed from your feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb 
without spot or blemish. That word precious is the word honorable. So when God says honorable is marriage, God is saying in my sight, marriage is precious. How precious? As precious as the blood of Christ. So is marriage an important thing to God? The way he intended, it is precious. And yet what has our world turned marriage into? It's turned it into anything goes. And that is not God's intention. It's honorable. It's precious. It's without spot. It's without blemish, just as Christ's blood was. The latter part of that verse says that the bed is undefiled. Well, and what does that mean? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it tells us a little bit about heaven. And it says, To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and fading not away, kept in heaven for you. So the word undefiled means there is nothing wrong with it. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. When we go to heaven, is there going to be anything in heaven that will be even the least bit defiling? Heaven is a place of purity. It's a place of God's holiness. So when God says the bed of the marriage, according to his definition, is undefiled, God is looking at the union of a husband and wife as something precious and pure. And what has the world turned it into? Anything goes. And that's not God's intention. Love and purity. Now, you don't have this reference. This is one of these. If you write anything down, write this passage down right here. Put it on the back of your bulletin, on the front of your bulletin, wherever you can write it down, write down this passage because this, this is a very, very important passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 32 through 34. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32 through 34. And the Apostle Paul writes this, I want you to be free from anxieties or the cares of this world. The unmarried man is anxious or cares about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. So you know what, guys, if, if you're not married, guess where your attentions should be. Guess what you should be caring about. Guess who you should be pleasing. The Lord. Verse 33 the unmarried man is anxious or cares about worldly things, or the married man, should I say, is anxious or cares about the worldly things, how he may please his wife. So what's the difference here? If you're not married, your cares and your concerns should be to please Christ. If you are married, the Bible says you should care and be concerned about pleasing your wife. Verse 34, his interests are divided. And the unmarried and betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. So again, unmarried, if you are not a married young lady, keep yourself pure. This verse says that God wants you to be holy in body and spirit. Purity is what God wants from you. And then he goes on to say that the married woman cares about the worldly things, how she may please her husband. In God's eyes, if you are unmarried, you keep yourself pure. You keep yourself for the person that you will someday marry. Keep yourself pure in body and in spirit. If you're not married, the cares that you have should not be cares about yourself or anything else. Your cares should be about pleasing God. 
What does God want of you? How can God use you as a single person? And the best way he can use you, obviously, is through your purity, to be an example, especially in this world. This world, I mean, it, it, it's like if, if you are a pure Christian and don't sleep around, there's got to be something wrong with you. But you know what God tells us? That's what God values. That is precious in his sight, that you're saving yourself for the person that you will someday marry. And if you are married, you should be caring about your spouse. You should be caring about how can I please my spouse? What are the things that I can do that will, um, that will encourage and benefit and please my spouse? So we please the Lord 100%. We please our spouse 100%. Well, what about if you're married? How do, what, is, what does it mean once you're married, then you no longer have to worry about pleasing the Lord? <laughs> no, because you are one flesh. And guess what? As one flesh, you as a husband and wife should be pleasing the Lord together. You now have a higher calling. Husband and wife are to please and serve the Lord together. There's nothing harder than, than uh, somebody trying to minister if their spouse is not in on it with them. If the spouse says, oh, that, that's your thing, just you know, do what you're going to do. You know, it's, that's not what God intended. God intended for the husband and wife as one to serve God together, to be in it together. God wants us to be holy in body and spirit. The phrase that God uses time and time again throughout the scripture is be holy as I am holy. And to live a life of purity, to live a life of honoring God through our physical body is an extremely important thing. Now what if, what if I've already messed up? What if I've already, you know, it's, it's too late, you know, I've, I've messed everything up at this point and now, now what? Start fresh from today. Start fresh from today. Make up your mind that starting today, you're going to live your life the way God wants you to live it. You're going to keep your heart and your mind and your body pure. Start today. Don't look back. It's too easy to look back and get all discouraged because, oh man, I, I, was, I was pretty bad. Don't do that. Look ahead. Look ahead to what God has in, in mind for you with a fresh start. The Holy Spirit will help you to live that life. And, and remember, don't try to fight what's going on because you can't do it. Run. Run. Don't let this world wrestle you into their way of thinking. Run from it. Where do we run? Run to God. It's a good place to run to. Yeah, remember the days when you'd play um, tag and there was always a safe point and you know, they'd be chasing you, man, you make a beeline for that safe point. Make God your safe point. Run from the temptations and run to God. We're going to wind this up right now. A couple of minutes early, but I 